Good morning. I'm not David Gallo. I'm not preaching this morning. But uh, I am going to give you an update on some of our mission work. I'm Jimmy Gillum. I'm the deacon over missions here at Central. And uh, we cover India, Ghana, Mission Athens, and also we cover Central Valley. And we want you to understand it is a mission. It's your mission where you support that. And, um, but to kind of give you an update, we started out with 20-plus people over there. We're up to 45 to 50 right now, which we're doing really well. And uh, we can ask for your continued prayers on that. So I just got a couple of minutes. I want to share something with you. About two weeks ago, a guy that's been coming over there since April approached me, and he asked if he could look at uh, doing some TV sponsorship, some promotion for Central Valley. And uh, he went and checked on price, and he said, I'll pay for it. So that's in the books right now. So within the next couple of months, we'll be on TV promoting uh, Central Valley over there in Madison. So we're really excited about that. But one thing I want you to ask for you to do is for prayers. And also, we need some families to come over there. And I'm not saying dedicated. I'm talking about visitation. Whenever we have people visiting from Central, it shows our people over there that we're not alone, that we're continually being looked at and, uh, and wanting to help. So we have very uh, minimal families over there with small children. Uh, Grace Ennis over there, she is our um, lead on our children's ministry. So it would be an encouragement to her if some of you had visited. Some of you already have, we appreciate that. And, uh, but continue to do that. Tonight we'll have a movie night, a family movie night. July the 6th, we're going to have a depression um, support group led by Alyssa Fincham. And uh, so we encourage you to check our Facebook page. Also, our Central Valley website, cvfamily.org. Check on that and uh, see the upcoming thing because it is your ministry along with India, Ghana. And some of you can't go to Ghana and India. We understand that. But you can come over and visit with us. Uh, so we encourage you to do that and encourage you to continue to pray. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Once I was there, okay. You guys can share. There you go. I don't need that anymore. Um, a couple of other announcements we need to make before we um, get started is, I don't know if you guys noticed yet, but this children's ministry and what they've done in this hall is incredible. I'm telling you, it is incredible. And they put a lot of work into that and um, done a lot of good things. And then those children are just so excited to be part of this church and to grow um, in God. And I just, Allie and Christian did a really good job putting that together. And um, let's um, just remember them. Also, this morning... Um, there's a special um, workshop for people who want to, to help in the children's ministry. Um, there's going to be about a few people coming from the Beltline Church of Christ in Decatur that work with the children that do what we're doing, and they're going to come and, and teach us how to teach these children in the ways that, that, they, that we can. And uh, we want you to be part of that. That's going to be after class. There's going to be a um, lunch in the gym, and then followed by, it's just going to a time where they're going to teach us how to teach children, and so we're not frustrated. So that'll be going on also. Um, this week, the teenagers got back from Impact, and it was awesome, and I heard a lot of good things, but one of the great news about this is Macy Dobbs became a Christian this, this, um, this week. So good job on Macy. Um, Good, good job to our interns and Adam. Um, I drove the bus up there, a little quick story. I drove the bus up there um, Monday, and they were full of teenagers. And I look back in the back, and Adam is sitting there with his head just kind of against the one of the chairs in the um, bus, just warm. But he is a trooper. He does a great job with his youth ministry, and let's remember that. And he does that, did that all week with these kids. So um, let's remember them. Let's pray, and let's pray for the Central Valley Church before we get started. And then we're going to have some fun. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for your spirit that just constantly blows. Father, constantly moves and constantly is replenishing us. Father, we ask a special prayer this morning upon the Central Valley Church. Father, for the people over there that are meeting right now, Father, we ask a, a prayer upon them. God, fill them with your goodness, Father. Give them faith. And Father, I pray that they don't be discouraged in whatever happens. Father, help them to always be, have a spirit of goodness and of love. 
Father, so many people are coming through and learning about you, and I ask a special prayer upon that church. Lord, be with our children here at this church. Father, and, and what's going on here in this, this um, awesome ministry, Father, that's growing. And we pray for the kids in this church and the, the leaders and the parents and the, the older generation, God, as we work together to um, help these kids. God, we thank you so much for the gift of baptism. And Father, for Macy, God, being a Christian. Father, that is so good. And we are so thankful, Father, that you're, you are still alive and you're still working. We love you, God. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen. amen. Thanks, Thank Jimmy. You. Thanks. I love sports. Love them. Not very good at them, but I love them. I can remember in high school trying to play every sport that my small town could offer. Football was my favorite. Basketball was right there. I was horrible. And track. Track was a very important um, springtime um, activity and a sport that I participated in. I really wasn't very good, and I'm really still not very good at running, but I felt like, hey, everybody's doing it, so I better join and have, enjoy the track, um, meet, meet with my friends. But what's interesting about track is what goes on. I am not a long-distance guy. I barely, if I'm with everything in me, can sprint maybe to that end of, that hall, end of the aisle without running out of breath. But I was a sprinter. I wasn't a long-distance guy, and... I ran the 100, the 200, I did a long jump. But one of the greatest races that I did, and it's still the most electric race in the sport of track, is the 4x100, where four people together run one whole lap around that track. I was the third guy. Do you know who that guy is? That's the fill-in. I, I, they're like, we got to have somebody. Let's put Gallo out there. So I was the third guy, and I'll get to a reason why I was the third guy. Um, the first guy in a track meet was, the, was your second fastest guy on the, on, the, in, on the relay. He was the one that had to get in the blocks whenever, it took, whenever, the, the, the signal, whenever the gun fired. He had to get a good lead. He would go around the corner, and he would pass it to the second guy, the baton to the second guy. And then whenever the baton was passed to the second guy, the second guy would run down the straight stretch and get to the third guy, which was just there. And he would get, get it, and he would go around the corner and give it to your anchor man, which was the fastest on the team. And he would try to blow by everybody and win. You see, when I was in the right, whenever I, whenever I raced, there was a lot of things going on in a relay that you might not realize. A lot of things happen. And for instance, whenever, I, whenever we get out there and we all get our spots and everybody's a distance away and get, we're getting ready, I'm standing there and I have to mark 15 feet behind me. So I'll mark 15 feet, 15 feet, and I'll put like a piece of grass on the track. And then I'll get, back, get ready for my spot. The reason for that piece of grass is that whenever the second guy runs and when he hits that, I've got to start going because I've got to be full speed whenever he hands me the baton. Too many times, they won't, they'll run past that and then this guy will start and they'll kind of come up on each other. You have to run so perfectly and so eloquently that it, it works perfectly. And I can remember setting that spot, getting in my position, and whenever that guy's coming, I was take off and then whenever he would get close enough to me, he would yell the word reach. Where at that point, I would stick my arm out like that. And I'm running, and it's hard running if you try that, running like that. And I've got to keep it steady and where he will pass that baton. I'll get it, and then he lets go, and I take off. The hardest part can be to grab it or to give it. Some will say it's harder either way, you know, whatever. But whenever you give it, you will see that hand shaking. You'll see that hand shaking. And you're sitting there going, oh man, oh man, I've got to give this, give this before I get to a certain spot or it's going to be we're going to be disqualified. And so you pass that. 
the taunt. And you go, and it's a fast-moving thing. It's a fast-moving um, race. When passing the baton, you have to have focus, effort, and most important, discipline to pass that baton. You can't just say, all right, all right, he's coming, I better get ready. You have to know what's going to happen and prepare yourself to get up and move. And isn't that the same in the church? Passing the baton. That's exactly what we are supposed to do in the church. Pass the baton of faith to the next generation. And it's hard. To many of us that are older, the older generation is hard. We get tired, we're like, come on, are they gonna grab it or not? Are they going to grab it or not? To the, the younger generation sitting there going, are you going to give it or not? So there's a conflict. Let me put it this way. And while I go through this sermon, I'm going to, it's going to get pretty ugly at first, but then we're going to come out, it's going to be rainbows and all that kind of stuff. So get ready for that. So get ready, prepare your feet. They're going to be stepped on. I, I'm studying this stuff. I was, it's hurt me this week. This is very interesting and very convicting. Look at this stat. We wonder if the, if the baton is being passed in the church today. We wonder if, it's, if something's happening. In, in 2007, the Pew Research found out that 79% of people called themselves Christians. Now, that's a very umbrella-like saying. You can call yourself a Christian and not really go to church too. 79% call themselves Christians, and that's a good number, right? That's pretty good, almost 80%. But as of Tuesday, as of Tuesday this week, the research came back out, and this week, guess what it is? 10 years from now, it is now 70. In 10 years, 10% have left the church. 10% have left the church or have no affiliation to Christianity at all. And, and, and it can be a lot of reasons why that could happen. That number, you should look at that number, that let that penetrate your heart and be convicted. That is poor. That is poor. People are leaving Christianity in drones, tons. In droves, they're leaving Christianity. About 106 million Christians are expected to switch affiliation or to nothing from 2010 to 2050. 106 million people are going to leave Christianity by 2050. To those who won't be around then, I hope that scares you. I hope that frightens you because something is happening in our culture where we're putting Christianity along with sports and, and going shopping and doing all these things and it's just a subplot in our life instead of being our life. In, what, in 2050, 106 million Christians are expected to leave while 40 million are expected to enter Christianity. 40 million coming and 106 million people leaving. If that's fine with you, we got some serious issues. These kids today in this auditorium are hurting. They're looking for something, looking for leadership, looking for older generations, parents, whatever to lead them. When you start, when you merely start to recognize God's commands in the Bible as suggestions, that is when your life starts falling apart. And I think too many times when it's passing the baton, we go, well, I don't want to do that. Eh, that's cool, but you know, no. Or some of the things you want to do. But we don't do it. When we start thinking of them as suggestions, your life will fall apart. If you went home right now and 
If we all did this, I won't, we probably, none of us will do this, but if you did a life chart of your spiritual life throughout your life, all, throughout your life, obviously, but go through a, your life chart of spiritual, spiritual life chart, where your highs and your lows of, li- of life, you will find whenever you hit those lows, those were the times you were treating the Bible and the church and Christianity as just something else. I guarantee it. You see, partial obedience to the things of God is nothing more than disobedience. When you say, I'll do half of it. You know, Christianity is about me, right? It's about me. Just I want the things of what I want, and I'm not going to pass it on. I, I just want what I want. It becomes disobedient. We treat the Bible, for instance, like a phone book. We pick and choose what we want. We find, oh, what, what can we find a good scripture to put on a coffee mug or put on our Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and, and we can do that because, oh, that's clever, that's good. But we forget that the Bible is a whole. It is a beautiful thing, and when we start picking things out, we're missing the whole context. Think of this. The Word of God is like oxygen. Yesterday's oxygen will not sustain you. The Word of God is like oxygen. Yesterday's oxygen will not sustain you for today. You have to. As adults and as children, we have to be in the Bible. We have to study. We have to know. We have to be part of each other's lives to see how beautiful God is. I want to show you this. Some know this guy. Um, If you've ever seen the magic show, Penn and Will, what is it? Penn and Teller. All right, um, this guy is an atheist. Look what he says about Christianity. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't share their faith. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not get eternal life and you think that it is, it's not really worth telling them this because it makes you social, socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone? Do not proselytize. How much do you have to hate someone? How much do you have to have to hate someone? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Especially your own children. I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point where I tackle you and, that, and this is more important than that. That is a telling Telling quote, when we start understanding that Christianity and this idea is bigger than what we can imagine, when we don't tell the next generation because I've already been there, done that, I've done my time, wrong attitude. Because when you think that, I am so glad Jesus did not think that on the way to the cross. My time's done. I'm done. I've done my time. You are never, never retired or out of gas as a Christian until you die. It is our duty, it is our privilege, it is our joy. With this quote, it makes me think of something interesting because what's happening in the church and the Christianity is our commitment level. You see, commitment to telling the next generation or to... to, um, Witnessing to other people is replaced by complacency, which is then replaced by compromise. Commitment replaced by complacency, then by compromise. Generations start to compromise the faith, and you're going to see that in the Bible. And it, because we start treating Jesus like a spiritual buffet. We pick and choose what we like or what we don't like. Where Jesus says, if you want to become a Christian, it's all or nothing. That's why when you become baptized, your whole body is covered with water. It's all or nothing. Turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Told you it's going to be pretty rough, but I'm going to bring it up. I want you to read this because what has happened in the book of Judges to this point is Moses has died. 
Moses has brought the people out of Israel and out of Egypt, out of Israel, out of Egypt, a bondage, brought them the law, taught them the law with a lot of complaining and a lot of backlash. He kept teaching the law. Whenever he was to die, when he died, he passed it on to Joshua. Joshua did the same thing. At this point in the book of Judges chapter 2, Joshua was passed on. Joshua has died. And look at what happens. Look very carefully at this, Christians. Pay attention to these words of God. Verse, chapter 2, verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of the fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Whoa. Get that. Just let that sink in a second. Because they forsook him and served the Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger, Israel and in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies and all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. When, whenever Israel went to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn, and they were in great distress. You see, one generation was great. They loved the Lord. They loved his laws. They, man, they couldn't wait to be at church. They couldn't wait to be with people. They were passing it on to their children. They were enjoying the favor. But then something happens in this verse where it didn't pass. The baton didn't pass. One generation was good. The other one failed. But get this, and you know this is through generational studies, that when one generation does this, the next generation not only just doesn't care about God, what does the Bible say? They provoked him to anger. They ticked him off. They're like, bring it on, God. I, we hate you. So one generation is passing, is doing it. The other generation is like, man, I don't even care about God. Who's wrong? Who, what happened in this situation? We're going to find out what happened. Because let me tell you something, church. It's happening right now. It's happening in our culture right now. And if you haven't seen it, wake up. Flip on the news. A generation is not passing the baton, and one generation is not receiving the baton. And we're going to fix that this morning. I want, to know, I want you to underline three words in these in this scriptures, because I want to stop and I want to talk about these three words. The three words are this. Knew, forsook, and followed. I want you to pay very close attention to those three words in the book of Judges because those will tell us so much about passing the faith on to the next generation. This word knew, this word knew is not intellectual. It's not like they didn't know that God brought them out of the red, from the Red Sea or brought them from Egyptian bondage or, or saw the walls of Jericho fall. They knew that. Just like today's generation knows who God is. They died on the cross and he was resurrected. The problem is, where am I at? The problem is they had never learned to revere and rejoice what God has done. So you can know something, and then you can know something. So they knew who God was, but they did not hear, or it was never passed down about what God has done in their lives. So God was to them as just a CEO of a business that you will never talk to or be a part of. The next word here is forsook. This word is very, very harsh in the Hebrew language. The word means simply to, it, would, be, it, it is meant to serve someone the divorce papers. It is 
one of the worst things you could do. It's telling God, I'm done with you. I am done with Christianity. Some in this room have children that are doing this, that are like, I'm done with this junk. And be gone. That is what this forsaking, this word means. It is a harsh word. It's not saying, I oh, got I'm, I'm, I'll be back later. It's, I'm done. I'm going to divorce you. That is a harsh word in the Hebrew language. And then the last word is followed. The word followed. I asked, uh, when, I'm, when I was in Houston, I asked one of my elders this. I asked, uh, we were talking one night, and I said, how do you know when your heart is fully following the Lord? How do you know, guys, when your heart is fully following the Lord? Because sometimes we will think it is, and it's not. So I was thinking, how do you know when you're fully following the Lord? He told me two questions. He says this. David, he says this. Where do you turn when you're tired, you're scared, you're anxious or frustrated? Where do you turn? Do you turn to sex? Turn to alcohol? Work? How about buying things? Shopping? Or food? What do you turn to when you are scared or you're anxious or you're frustrated? That's one indicator on what you really follow. The next question really kind of shook me a little bit. He said this, where do you turn in moments of joy? What are the things, David, that makes you come alive? The things that no one has to convince you to do. You see, you ever notice that the things you actually love, you don't need any external motivation. You just do it because you love it. You you turn on an Arkansas Razorback game, I'm on it. You don't have to tell me, hey, go in there and watch Arkansas football. Some of you Alabama fans or Auburn fans the same way. You don't have to tell anybody, tell you, hey, don't forget the Alabama game's on today. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll try to go watch it. No, you're like, I'm on it. You plan your day accordingly, right? I do too. You don't have to tell me to go and watch the next Star Wars. I will watch it. I don't need any external motivation to say, David, have you thought about watching Star Wars? It's a pretty good movie, and you might want to watch it. Oh, really? What's it like? No, I'm like, I'm there. I love Star Wars. You don't have to tell me these things. Where you find your joy, that's where you find your heart. And that's following God. Whenever it is like, hey, guess what? It's church tonight. Oh, I don't know if I want to go. Is it really something you're following? Oh, I got to go serve out there. Oh, hey, I don't know if I need, uh, is it really what you're following? Call it what it is. Let's be real honest. Do you need motivation that you shouldn't have because your heart's not connected with God? You see, I want you, I want to be very careful where I'm about to tread here, and I want you to go and put your steel-toed steel -toed boots on because it's going to get, I'm going to hit your toes real hard right here. Why is it so hard to convince Christians to get excited about Jesus? Why is it so hard to convince people to get excited about Jesus? Because Jesus is very rarely the God of the Christians. He's very rarely the God of the Christians. You see... In these two verses, in these verses we read, two, two generations, one who did not pass the baton and the other one, a generation who did not take it. So how do we, as a church, change this pattern of Christianity? How do we, here in this town of Athens, in Alabama, in the South, in the United States, change this idea, change this pattern of false Christianity? What does the Bible say about it? Look in Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Flip over there. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. We'll start here. Hear, O Israel, 
Let's put it more personal. Hear, O Athens. Hear. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your homes and on your gates. Number one thing, three points in this. Number one is we ourselves, you personally, have and must love God wholeheartedly. These commands must be on our heart. You see, the younger generation is very sensitive. I'm going to even say hypersensitive to inconsistency. Your actions reflect your behavior. You can say a big game, but if you don't do show up, if you're not there, if you're not praying, if you're not being a part of their lives, it's pointless. That is number one. We love God. It don't matter if you, don't, if you have kids or don't have kids. They seek inconsistency. You want to pass the baton, be consistent. Walk the walk. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Impress them on your heart. Impress his laws on your heart. Number two, we are to reflect and apply the gospel practically. Not just academically or abstractly. Like, oh, we know the gospel. Okay, we do do it. It's not just here, guys. And too many times it's easier to just do it here than here. And whenever we start to apply and, and practice and apply the gospel practically, watch what happens. You see, Deuteronomy 6 7. When he says this about, is it, when he talks about these, the, the parents, these children, it's not promoting regular family lectures. It's not promoting you sitting there and have a, pre, a family lecture. I can remember when I was a kid, by the way, just real fast, side note, my mom is here this morning. She's never heard me preach. She is here this morning. So I'm going to kind of um, embarrass our family a little bit. All right. <laughs> I remember we used to have a family devotional time. It lasted two nights. We did this book, and it was called Time Out for God. And it was so cheesy. I, oh, man. I remember Dad being, I, felt, I feel sorry for him now, but I can remember him trying to come in there and say, all right, Justin, David, come on. And I felt, man, I was like, man, get, get out of here. I was like 13 years old. I was like, I have better things to do. It didn't work. It didn't work until they figured out how to do this. Because I want you to look very closely at these verses. Notice very closely, and if you want to underline these, the words to sit, walk along, lie down, and get up. These are moving things. Too many times we look at Deuteronomy 6 and go, oh, that means we got to have a devotional. No, it's walking along, impress them, sitting with them, walking along to wherever you go. And talking about God. Say, hey, God, do you, do you think, talk to your children. Do you think he's an Auburn fan or an Alabama fan? Do you think he likes football? I can remember a time in growing up where, well, I'll talk to that in a second. Let me get to that point, number three. Um, I, there was this guy in Houston told me a story about what he would do with his children. And this is awesome. Now, this is like pretty ridiculous awesome. So understand that. We're just normal people, you know. He said this, he said, whenever I get up, whenever we eat dinner at night, I have our kids memorize the scripture. They will sit at the table and they will memorize one scripture together. And my job as a dad, no matter what scripture they say, I will say the one before it and after it. I will have it memorized. <laughs> what happened to that faith? What happened to that obedience? What happened to that focus? Good night. I was like, you kidding, Mike? He said, no, that's what we do. Impressive. Those girls that he has are awesome girls, as you can tell, as you would know. 
I talked to a young woman, this, a young mother this week about, she was talking about how she can change the dynamic of her prayer life with her children. Instead of just being the same old, dear Lord, be with us this day and thanks for many blessings, amen. It was like, how do you teach them a little bit more creativity in their prayers and understanding God's bigger than just a simple line? I said, well, grab a rock or something and pray about it. You're like, what do you mean? Well, you get a rock and you pray, God, I pray that, you start figuring it out. You go, man, with these sharp edges, God, I pray, Father, that you always cut my heart whenever I need it. Father, with this hard rock, I pray that I will always, always know that you are the rock of my life. You find whatever you can and you use it to glorify God. He's everywhere. We're missing it. And remember this, be humble. You're not perfect. Your kids know that. And just be honest. And the last thing is I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20 through 25. In the future, prepare yourselves for this one, guys. The Bible is awesome about what it's about to say. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of, of the stipulations, decrees, and laws of the Lord our God has commanded you? In other words, what, why do you guys, why do I go to church? Why, Dad, Mom, family, why do you do what you do? You tell them this. The Bible says, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and to give us the land that he has promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all of these decrees and to fear the Lord, our God, so that we might always prosper and he might, and be kept alive, as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all the laws before the Lord our God, as he commanded, that we will be, that will be our righteousness. Deuteronomy 6, verse 20, is very simple. And I think as a church, not just parents, get this. If you are an older person in this room, online, wherever you're at, this point is critical because these verses talk about how we should link the concepts of our faith to God's action in our lives. Instead of just talking churchy and religion needs, you talk about Jesus and his wonders. You hear it see in the Bible, it says, what are you supposed to tell? What am I supposed to tell my child when they ask what you do? Say, man, I, I was wrong. I messed up. I had a problem when I was younger. I might have been an alcoholic or, or, or whatever. And God has brought me in who I am alive today because of him. Those children will go, that's what I'm talking about. That's all you do. You tell your story. You tell your story. God did this in my life and say something. Parents, grandparents, that is critical in passing the baton. Kids don't want to know all the time the 12 apostles or the books of the Bible. They want to know what God's really doing in your life. Why are you doing this? That speaks volumes. You're seeing it right here, how it works. I can remember sitting on the porch um, when I was younger, and we had a pond, big pond out there in our yard. And I can remember times sitting out there with mom or dad, and what we'd do is we'd just talk about God. We didn't talk about much anything. It was just God. Like I remember, there would be a lot of deer out there in our in our field in a big area in the country. And I remember a deer coming up and just getting some water. And mom, mom talking about how I said, "Look at that deer. Isn't that cool? Getting the water." She says, "Isn't that neat? How God tells us to be more thirsty for the Word of God." And I would sit there and just go, "Whoa!" And I would see God play out everyday life. I still do today. People say, no, I'm, I'm not saying it, but people say, why do you smile a lot? Because God's everywhere. How can you not see him? Last thing I want to say is this. In order for us to pass the baton of faith to the next generation, we as a church must be 
consistent in our behavior, wise about reality, and personal about our faith. Those things matter. And even if you don't have kids, it's just as important. Consistent in your behavior. You talk a big game, do it. Start praying for different things. Start praying for people and actually doing something for those people. Go visit those people. Watch the next generation. They will follow and they will learn. Wise about a reality that it's horrible. Reality's tough living in this world. As an adult, we all know that it's hard. And the younger generation needs to know that, to know that there's only one way out of it, and that's God. And personal about our faith. I love these pictures. Kind of says a picture is worth a thousand words. I love this picture of Scott Crooms in Ghana. If you ever saw him out there with those kids, it's awesome. When you go through these halls and you see these, these adults with these kids, teaching them, maybe those kids are out of control and that teacher's in there just trying to do it. I see awesomeness. I see someone dedicated to share their love to the next generation. There's something important about seeing older people carry that on to the next generation. So what I want to do is something special this morning. I want to do something a little special this morning. I'm going to ask all the kids, kids, you listening? All kids, Lydia, you listening? Gunner? I want all the kids to go, that's involved in the children's ministry, to go in the back lobby. Just go on back there. Go back there. We're going to do something real special with you. And you're going to see some adults get up too. But I want the kids, to all the kids in this church to go in that back lobby. This is very important. Sharing the faith, passing the baton, and getting serious about our Christianity. It's a serious thing we do as a church because we love kids. We love your kids a lot. But most importantly, God is in love with the children. The greatest story you can think about Jesus is with the kids, and he gets them, and he gets down with them. When all the apostles are talking about junk, he sits there with the kids, and he just says, oh, yeah, this is it. This makes sense. Get it like a child. That's what makes sense. So if you would... Pay very, very close attention to this video. I put together this last few weeks to show you what it is and how to carry the faith on to the next generation. Eric, get those lights. Miss Becky, I like her because she's my teacher. I look up to her. I look up to Allie because she... She shows Jesus because she um, tries to help the church and improves it so much. I look up to Jackson Hill. I see Jesus in him because he does a lot of work with church, and he's always just a really good guy to people. Um, I look up to Tom Coram because he believes in Jesus, and I believe in Jesus too. When I look up to Mr. Casey Jones, I, I see in his heart that he loves Jesus. Good father, it's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. Hey, I just want to tell the next generation that God loves you, and always remember that God wants you to trust him and to keep praying to him for whatever you need, whatever you think that he would like for you to have in your life and live the kind of life he so that you can go to heaven and uh, just don't ever forget that to trust in him and know how much he loves you all the time. The greatest thing that I'd like to leave to the younger generation is that a lot of things are going to happen to you in your life. You're getting a new challenge, you're going to have new dreams, new opportunities, but also life happens and sometimes bad things happen. 
So I think that you need to make sure that you have something to hold you down, to hold, have an anchor for your soul. Even if you're very successful, you need to remember that God is always the one in control. And the one, if you have trouble in life, you need to have something to hold on to, to get you through the hard times. So I would add, advise you to have an anchor for your soul, which is your faith in Jesus Christ. I'd love to tell the next generation to embrace people that are different than you. Uh, you know, just hang out to people that are like you. Your horizons don't grow. So embrace people that are different than you, and you'll just you'll just see how people are special in different ways. And um, and finally, just love, just love. I want children to understand that God loved them so much and sent Jesus to this earth to die and rise again so that we could be with him because we are all God's favorite. To the next generation, I would say always keep God on your heart and on your mind. Always keep Jesus Christ in your hearts. Too much distraction out there in the world today. And uh, it's a trying time, especially for our teenagers. They have a lot of uh, uh, things against them out there. But uh, we as Christians, we as adults can help them uh, and help themselves in a loving manner and uh, just keep Jesus Christ on your heart. This morning is a special time because it's time for a church to rise up and to say, you know what, I want to pass on this love that God has for me, God has for you, to this next generation. It's so important. This is the relay. And let's never, ever get tired of doing it. Never those times when you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. I'm so tired. Keep going. Keep going against the wind. Even whenever, if you're a parent and you're just tired of, hey, don't get it, my kids don't get it, well, you know what? You keep going. You keep going. This morning, you're going to see the kids come through here. And I want you to do so. I'll tell you guys what to do in a second. But I want to share with you guys what generations that come together look like. Watch very carefully. Let me do this. You can come on out, Jessica, and all them. There they are.
Everybody sit down, please. Nick says get out. Everybody sit down. Get a good picture. This is what a church looks like. The past and the future. Too many times we say the kids are the future of the church. That's the biggest lie we could ever believe. The kids are the present of this church. This older generation is not the church of the past, as we may think it is. They are the present too, and that's what makes the church the perfect gift, because this is the present. We might, I don't have any children, but I've got 70 kids. Love these kids, and you should too. This is an important thing. It's beautiful, isn't it? Passing the baton takes work, takes effort, and takes focus. And this is what we have to do as a church to raise these children and be part of their lives. John Bullington's going to lead us in a prayer for both generations, all generations of this church. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this service this morning. It's been refreshing and enlightening. We appreciate the enthusiasm that David has shown and has demonstrated in his lesson that he's so ably prepared and delivered to us this morning. Father, we're moved when we look around the, about us on this stage and see these young children. Father, we realize that they are our future and that Jesus said, except we repent and become as a little child, we'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Our Heavenly Father, help us to know the difference between childlikeness and childishness. And Father, help us to avoid, avoid being childish but strive to be like children in that we can be taught, we can learn to follow, we can learn from the older generation. Our Heavenly Father, help us as older people to realize that maybe our life, we're in the twilight of our life, but we still have an influence. And Heavenly Father, help us never to forget and never to retire from trying to serve you every way that we possibly can. Father, we're thankful for this church. We're thankful for the spirit that prevails here, and we ask you to help us to strengthen the bonds of peace that hold us together and help us to look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, again, we ask you to bless these children. Bless the parents, bless the grandparents, bless the leadership uh, of this congregation, and help us always to strive to please you in every way that we can. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins and help us always to strive to do what is right in your sight. And Father, we would not in we would not end this prayer without praying for some of our older ones. We've already prayed for Mo and for Patty and the Scriptures, but we also want to pray for Buddy and Lila Chambers and for their family. They're going through uh, struggles and health problems, and we ask you to be with them. Father, be with us all and help us to do everything we can to point people to Christ and to show the way. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Guys, you guys can be seated. Thanks, guys. Give me a hand. Hey, good job. Special. Isn't that special? Sometimes we don't just get a, we don't see it enough. Thanks, you guys, for helping be part of that. 
This morning, as we close, I want to ask a couple questions to you. One is, well, if you're not a Christian, what in the world? How can you not be part of the awesome family of God? And number two, if you feel like this morning you're like, I want to do better at passing the faith. I feel like I'm, I, I might be struggling, I might be in this rut, and I don't know how to do it. Come forward, let's pray, let's figure it out. It's worth it. It's worth it. This morning, I hope the heart, your hearts were stirred. Hopefully that you saw the Spirit of God and what it looks like, what a church is supposed to look like. This morning, if you need anything at all, that's why we're a family. Let's come now as we stand and sing.